there was like a huge closet of red hats. <laughs> and so we put them on and like took photos in front of the gold records and then shoved like three of them down my pants and we rolled out of there. Oi, oi, all right, all right, how's it going? I'm Grant, you're you, this is Do The Review. I'm not gonna waste too much time before getting into it. Today's episode of Ulterior Underground, I'm very, very excited to share. A full length conversation I recently had with Travis Keller, founder of the cult 2000s online music scene, Buddyhead. If you don't know anything about Buddyhead, pause this video, hit the description and hit the link to the last week's video where I kind of break down what made Buddyhead so important you know, or just hit up Wikipedia if you want to go medieval and read some text, I guess. Um, this conversation was really cool and I can't thank Travis enough for giving up his time to talk to me. We covered so much ground, including the future of a buddy head movie, feuding with Limp Biscuit, beefing with Axl Rose, getting jumped by the transplants, touring with Nine Inch Nails and so much more. Travis and Buddy Head are still up to loads of cool shit. Hit the links down below to check some of that out. And disclaimer, this is the first time I've ever done an interview. So I'm very much welcoming, you know, some constructive feedback in the comments. Ahead of time, I thought, oh, I speak to humans every day. How hard can it be? Well, it turns out there is probably some skill to it. Um, as you can see, I don't think I did too bad, but I'll definitely be looking to approve. Um, interviews are kind of become hopefully a bigger part of this channel. So stay tuned. All right. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Travis Keller, founder of Buddy Edge. There it is. <laughs> yeah, there it is. How's it All going? Right. Where are we Good. finding you? Uh, I'm at, let's see, I'm at uh, American Primitive Headquarters, which right now is at Joe Cardamone's house. Sick. Uh, I saw you guys have got like a, a new place though, right? Yeah, yeah. February 1st, we're starting to move into a new space. Uh, we haven't had a space since like uh, before the pandemic. We were before that we were in Burbank. Joe had a studio in Burbank. And yeah. uh, due to the pandemic, he shut that down and put it in his garage. And this is actually used to be Joe's bedroom and is where the Icker sign first play like practiced and stuff. And now it's like a editing oh, bay for us. It's like where we edit now. A lot of history gone down in that room. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, mate, by the way. I appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Hopefully I, um... hopefully I say all the right things. <laughs> mate, there's nothing uh, nothing that you can't not say. I've, um, I'm have like pretty new into this whole thing, but I uh, I wanted to give, give you a shout because I guess like, you know, whenever Buddy Head was in its heyday, I was just... I was just a nipper and it was like the first time that I figured out that just because something had a guitar didn't mean it was necessarily cool. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> yeah. I always, the way I describe it to people is like um, how other people talk about generations, like that guy in the, in the record store that would like tell you what was cool or not. That was basically like, that was buddy head for me. But that's kind of what we were, we were going for. Like what you would, you know, the, your older friend would tell you or you know your your bud you know that was always a uh, as opposed to like you know because there just wasn't a lot of media talking like that at the time you know it was all super like press releases and you know ask kissy totally yeah it was all i guess the like it's hard to imagine and i find it weird even though i was there i guess i was younger but like if you think how things have changed so much with like Twitter and I mean, the fact that you've just got like schmoes like me just talking up music. Now, the fact that there was really no other way to get music content is kind of baffling. Yeah. Some of the new stuff's cool. Like this is, this is fucking great. You know, the way information travels now is, is cool. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good things about what's happening now. How do you keep up with it? Like I was just listening um, this week I've been meaning to for ages and I went through like your sort of current roster of artists that you're like putting music out, like the quarterizers pyramids. Also yeah, yeah. cool. Like how do you come across that stuff? Cause it just feels like it's. Uh, most of the records I put out are just like, uh, like I think the basis for the label has pretty much been, I mean, aside from like a couple things that I can think of are just like records that normally wouldn't see the light of day that our stuff, our friends did, you know, mm -hmm. it was just like, most of them are people even since the beginning are just people that I've just known, you know, like through music, like, um, 
either through touring or putting shows on or, you know, um, cauterizers, we all worked at the same bar and uh, we became friends. And then they had like a surf band and they were just like the best party band. So um, I told them we had to start putting, putting some records out and we put like uh, a couple EPs out digitally and like a single, I think. And Mm -hmm. then this new full length, which is like their debut album uh, is coming out on vinyl as soon as, uh, Oh, sick. As soon as I crack the whip on the art guy and he finishes the art (laughs) for the art guy. But yeah, so yeah, it's one. on vinyl, which is which is kind of exciting. And um, yeah, I was going to ask you like if there was any plans for physical releases. So that's really cool to hear. Yeah, that one is already in the works, and uh, it should be out by like I don't know summer ish. <laughs> um, uh, and then we're gonna be uh, crowdfunding the Rathbone LP, which we put out digitally already. It's called Living in America, and it was like we did like I think we did it for three months. We did like a two song single every two weeks, I think it was. Uh-huh. And we picked like the best I don't even know ten songs or eleven songs out of that, and we made like an album. But uh, uh, yeah, we we started the GoFundMe, but we haven't like really told anyone about it yet. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to GoFundMe a vinyl release for that one as well. That's cool because so, that's it, a, that's it, a cool project that I'm pretty proud of. All the songs are, are great. I don't know if you've heard it, but it's uh it's kind of like indie rock, but uh, it's got an anti capitalist message. And, I was gonna um, say it's kind of like the uh, the the most representative of what it seems like kind of where you are at from like a political point of view at the moment it's kind of like a manifesto that album yeah he did it it was cool how it happened too it was very organic he just uh email he dm'd me like a a reel of the living in america song and i asked him if i could post it it did pretty well and then i just said hey we should like you know have kind of a label we should like put some of these out and it was just cool and then now we're like friends like you know we've he's come to LA played shows I've just went to his place in New Orleans and hung out and it's it's cool that like it just happened super organically like through the internet like that it's uh yeah. it's kind of when the internet works you know stuff like that is awesome he, he seems super prolific as well like I was just looking on streaming and it looks like there's already a couple other releases out as well yeah I think he's done at least two records I'm not even yeah he's super prolific and and now he's the TikTok guy people don't even really know he makes music now he's uh oh, really? now he's, yeah he's blown up on tiktok he's got like i don't even know how many like over two hundred thousand followers and they flew him to the middle east to talk at some like leftist conference yeah yeah he's great you gotta check out his tiktok it's that's a whole sick. a whole other thing <laughs> that's good i mean it is wild people just like blow up overnight on that on that platform yeah. and kind of others so it's that's not cool. anything to do with music. He's just kind of from a political point of view, like gotten that. Yeah, attention. he just does like little skits for the most part. Like he writes little scripts and uh, he kind of, I guess, acts out memes for lack of a better way to explain it, you know, and just kind of breaks down simple political concepts. Um, he's really good at it, though. Um, you got to check so it cool. out. Yeah, it's been that- cool to watch because it's like it's it's also like a lot of work, you know, Um being on there every day just the way the whole algorithm and you know once you're making content like that it's it's a lot but it's cool to watch him because he's good at it you know it's yeah inspiring. i feel like that platform tiktok gets a lot of flack from people that i don't know people my age and i've got friends that are older than me that like when i say tiktok they kind of like immediately scoff but if you find like the right stuff on there i've learned so much just whether it's about music or politics like it is quite interesting how stuff just finds you from all of these different places yeah i I love tiktok i mean i think it's like all the apps are kind of like it's how you use them you know they're just they're just tools and it's like you know like for instagram like my my instagram feed rules like all i follow is like skateboarders and communists you know i barely even follow people i know um because i use it for a certain purpose you know but i mean yeah. i think you can tailor your algorithm and uh yeah i mean i i learn a lot when i open tiktok you know do you uh, not think... um do you not like struggle i imagine with your account specifically like constantly battling being shadow banned or like having your page pulled down i've seen it a couple of times yeah i've been pretty lucky honestly i kind of just bounce between all of them 
Um, I've only had like a couple of them deleted. N- none of them, like never my main one, which has been nice. Um, I feel like I've I've been remained pretty unscathed considering. Um, I've been lucky for whatever reason. Like the other pages that post similar content, like they all have a, seems like they have a a harder time. I'm not sure why. Yeah, it's wild. Um, But that's cool. It's cool that you're able to to put that stuff out there. Um, Do you mind if I take it back a bit, talk a little bit about like Buddy Head and all that stuff? I'm going to try and avoid too much of stuff that you've been asked a bunch of times. Oh yeah, go ahead. I mean, I'm kind of, this is like, it's it's all current because we're about to start start making a movie and like um probably like a companion book with all the photos and stuff. So it's this is be rad. Even though it's old, uh, I'm kind of about ready to dive into it. So yeah, let's go. <laughs> I mean, how many hours of footage did you capture over that time? Because it must uh, have just we, just going through it must have been crazy. Yeah, we got like 250 hours, I think, ish. Jeez. You know, and we'll probably hopefully we'll collect some more just from you know other people that have there's a few other heads that have similar stuff that would help the story that that's kind of the next thing but yeah about 250 hours and then just a bunch of photos and um press from the time and stuff like that nice well i can't wait for that um but i saw it so to start you weren't born in la right you moved to la initially yeah, yeah. I, I was born in Spokane, Washington. And then I like went to like school, like grade school and high school in Moscow, Idaho, which is like up in the top of the the panhandle up there. And then I moved to Los wow. Angeles in 97. Okay. And then so it was like 98 that Buddy had started. So it wasn't that long, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was like right after I, I, I landed in LA and uh, kind of knew the Icarus line here at the time were called the Canker Sores. And they were kind of like uh, promoting shows and, you know, of other bands and then their own shows and booking tours and like, putting records out and they working at record labels. And um, I kind of just like fell into the middle of the punk scene. And I came from the world of like zines mm-hmm. and whatnot. And I um, that just seemed like what you did. So we started kind of covering the scene that we were in and like interviewing our friends' bands. That's kind of like how it all started. But like our zine just happened to be on the internet because I knew how to make web pages like before most people. So it just seemed like what we were, it just seemed like, oh, we'll reach more people, you know? It just seemed so, like a no brainer at the time. Yeah. It just seemed like what you do, you know, like we just came from the, the, the world or the, the, the scene of like punk where you just kind of everyone kind of does stuff you know so um yeah that's that's what i did and did you like what was the first thing do you remember the like first thing you put up was it always intended to end up being like reviews and interviews or was it just like no no random stuff it was supposed to be uh just a originally it was just supposed to be a portfolio of my photography so initially it was just like a bunch of my photos and then ikersign went on like their first tour and they they opened for Ink and Dagger, who at the time were like one of our favorite bands. And they did like an interview with them. And I think that was the first interview we put up. They like they came back from tour with like an Ink and Dagger interview. And then it just kind of became like a like whatever. We started doing record reviews and, you know, different types of features. And it kind of just like snowballed from there. That's awesome. And so I like as well that it just became what it became. Like it wasn't so much of a planned thing. No, it was very, very organic. Yeah, I mean, at first it was just like trying to make each other laugh, you know, and then it like we realized everyone that we kind of knew in our immediate scene was reading it and that was exciting. And then it was like people we'd never met, you know, and then it was like most of the music industry and kind of exploded and it just kind of kept having all these like, you know, oh, wow, this is this is fun. But yeah, there wasn't really like ever a plan or or yeah, there was no plan at all that's well that's how the best things happen generally isn't it um yeah i guess like me i could imagine music there was already like you say you came from a scene of like where there was various scenes and stuff and that's obviously that's well known in music but obviously i've like skating's a pretty big part of your life as well right or at least it was back then so was there anything comparable within the kind of like skating culture that would inspire bodyhead uh well when i first moved here i started working for acme skateboards i thought like i would be involved in the skateboard industry because 
like that's kind of like skateboarding was where I found kind of everything. It was where I got interested in like photography and and filming because in skateboarding, like you kind of have to prove that you land tricks. So what better way than to make skateboard videos, you mm-hmm. know, to to prove. And that's kind of like why I got into art and photography was skateboarding. And same with music, like every skateboard video was like a mixtape, you know, it would have like hip hop and rock music and and, you know, at a time when the internet was really early, like most people weren't even on it. That was like one of the ways you found new music was like through skateboarding. So, yeah, it was kind of like a, a starting point for me. And then when I moved here, I got like a job working for Acme Skateboards. And my friend was like the team manager. And I went out and filmed a bunch of skaters and was a uh, kind of helping them on one of the videos. And I just don't think it was what I thought thought it was going to be it wasn't really fun and then at the same time my friend's band was you know starting to go on tour and and that was fun so I just kind of got like sucked into that world I mean I can imagine if you were just like in an edit bay or doing admin well it was just like someone else is like touring I came from like skateboarding with my friends just for like fun and like making like kind of like now looking back kind of goofy videos and then transplanting to LA and everyone's like trying to get a part and it's stressful and they're trying to trick, you know, a hundred times and throwing their skateboard. And you know what I mean? It's just like, right. it's a different vibe. I think I, it just wasn't what I expected, you know? So yeah, I guess I just kind of like got sucked in more into music, but yeah, I've well, always skateboarded. I still skateboard. Um, I still love skateboarding. Um, that's right. Well, you guys got the weather for it over there, not to sound like a standard Brit, but <laughs> yeah it just got as cold as it's gonna get and just like well i I don't know about your guys's temperature but here it dipped to 55 i don't know what that is for you guys i don't know but i guess way better than here it's like i can look it up yeah yeah it's barely even (laughs) cold yeah we just had like well any of that like old school like those goofy old school skating videos any of that gonna make its way into like the body head stuff yeah for sure i just actually got a bunch of them i think they're like right here somewhere uh, I don't know where. Oh yeah, here they are. Yeah, like the intro will be like. Uh, let's see if there's one with a cover. Here we go. Here we go. Sick. You designed the cover as well. No, but I had my friend draw it. That's that was like supposed to be my car at the time. <laughs> yeah, other covers, but I don't see any of them. But yeah, we're gonna probably do like a little like uh it'll be like you know the history because it's going to be like a dueling story of the icarus line and buddy head which kind of started about the same time and really wouldn't exist without each other so we'll do like a little bit of backstory and that's my backstory and their backstory is this band the canker sores and and all the stuff they did so there'll be a little bit of like vhs kind of mega mix at the beginning probably i would say awesome i was going to ask you and you kind of already touched on it but um Are there any skate videos that stand out to you in terms of like where the soundtrack was just like kind of Uh, you still remember? Yeah, I mean, I loved all the Plan B videos. Uh, I don't know if their soundtracks were that great, but um, like visually they were pretty inspiring to me. I loved uh, this guy, Mike Tronowski, made them all. And then I loved all the the girl and chocolate videos that uh, Spike Jones made were pretty Plus influential because they would have like skits as well you know there's one called like goldfish where they're like skating with a goldfish bowl and they they keep passing it to different people and um yeah i just thought his shit was super creative and brought like a different element to skateboarding you know it was more artsy than jocks i guess yeah it's it's um it's crazy how influential that stuff i mean obviously spike jones would go on to actually like make films and stuff but just how much great talent came from that scene outside of the people actually like pulling the tricks for sure yeah i still think i don't know for me i I did like a bit of skating uh back in the day but like i was more just in it for all of the other like ephemera that came with it because i couldn't even pull an ollie but like the there's um i think it's jump off a building that had I can't remember whose segment it was, but uh, like a Pink Floyd segment in it. It was like all of these, I just remember so vividly, like songs that you wouldn't necessarily 
associate with like young people at the time they would just pull things in and you'd be like oh this is actually a banger yeah yeah i got it i think i bought like a jim croce cd because of rodney mullen's part which is like you know <laughs> our like folky kind of boomer artist but yeah yeah same but if it's good it's good for sure so obviously like with uh it wasn't was i don't know was it long from like when buddy had started to when i guess like the whole gossip trash talk element of the site like picked up steam yeah it was, was that quick like straight away yeah, like a year later probably we started doing that and then i mean i don't know whether you get sick and tired of being asked questions about that because obviously that's like the hell raising part of it's like a huge part of the legacy no i i think it's all pretty funny <laughs> i like i like talking about it, it makes me i just laugh. don't i think it's wild now because um i find it so difficult to wrap my brain when you think of it in today's context of like how you can go from shit talk in a band online to then having like death threats or people like, you know, it just, yeah, I yeah. don't understand how it escalates from there. Cause now it kind of doesn't matter. Right. People are always flinging shit at people on Twitter and whatnot, but. I mean, it was just like, it was, it was pre, you know, Perez Hilton or anything that really talked like that, especially about like major label artists or like yeah. celebrities they're just it was like pre all of that like now that's there's a million tabloid blogs and they kind of you know do almost like a similar vibe but yeah there just wasn't really any of that so i i don't think people i don't i don't think a lot of the artists were used to being told like what was up you know because mm -hmm. i think a lot of at least music press would just press like you know one sheets or press releases that the label would release you know do you think anything, any part of like why you would get such a rise out of people came from the fact that you weren't, you weren't just like gossip brags, like you weren't just like a people magazine or whatever, like you have people that actually knew about music. So there was like more of a pointed kind of dig because yeah, I think they couldn't. I think that's why the story of the Ickerson and Buddyhead are so important because we, we both like legitimized each other. Like, you uh -huh. know, it's like we would be out on tour or, you know playing festivals with different bands so it was like you know we were we were we were in the community so that's like how we were getting like a lot of the information we had like people were giving us cell phones of people to post or or whatever you know we were just we were just always meeting people and then like you know the bigger the site got the, the kind of the bigger the band got and the more people we met and it just kind of all fed off each other that was what yeah. so that go on sorry no go ahead i was gonna say like obviously so much of what um you know, the kind of like big public feuds happened was because you were like essentially just being like, fuck you, here's so-and-so's number, like here's Courtney Love's number, here's Fred yeah. Durst's number, like hit him up. At, at what point, because it seemed like a common like weapon that you would use, was there like any sort of like system where you would be like, okay, if they if they do this or they rise to this level, like now we're going nuclear, like now we're pressing the, getting the phone number. I was just kind of like, like whatever whenever we got a phone number we'd pretty much post it because it would always be <laughs> like kind of funny you know like i don't think we, we would that was just like we would get one you know and we'd just be like yeah it's going up you know <laughs> so funny <laughs> um so like how does how does something like the whole limp biscuit thing happen did you just one day slag them and be like you know this is jock rock bullshit yeah and i mean I think we, we we just thought like i mean at the time they were the biggest band in the world so it just seemed like a joke to us because they were like, you know, rap metal. And I don't know. Yeah. It was just like the antithesis of what we were into, you know? Um, and I think after, you know, it, we kind of became known for talking shit on all of those bands. And we happened to be at Interscope talking to them about uh, them basically buying ads on our website. And at the end of the meeting, the guy that we were meeting with, was like, Hey, by the way, you know fred durst's office is in the hall do you want to go down there he's out of town and i was like yeah of course you know let's go <laughs> and we went down there and he introduced us to his secretary and she just like opened the door and like locked us in there and so we were like in his office and later we said we like broke in but yeah we just got let in and locked in there and we just like started going through everything and there was like a huge closet of red hats <laughs> And so we put them on and like took photos in front of the gold records and then shoved like three of them down my pants and we rolled out of there. And then um, 
sold them on eBay. And um, yeah. And then just said like, we'd broke into his office and stuff. And then he like responded in the press and the British press said that he was like hiring people to beat us up and stuff. So we were a little worried for a while, but yeah, nothing, nothing from that ever happened to physical altercations. Yeah. I was going to say was that, did you ever actually at the time kind of get a sense of like, Oh, this is, this is pretty scary. Or did it always just feel like column inches? Like someone just trying. I mean, I'm surprised it didn't happen more. I got punched in the face once by, or yeah. Well, once like nine times, but by the dude from uh transplants, the, oh, the shit. rap singer guy, his name's skinhead Rob. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I didn't even write it. Like someone wrote i think it was aaron he wrote like good charlotte sucks like verbatim like it wasn't even like a joke it was just like one of the lines of the gossip right he just said good charlotte sucks and that he came to punch me because that was written on my website and yeah i was like at the plea for peace show it was like some big benefit show and i walked out from like backstage and he asked if i was the guy from buddy head and i said yeah and he just like hit me like three times and then I said, I'm not going to fight you. And he hit me three more times. <laughs> and then I said, I'm not going to fight you. And he hit me three more times. And then it got like broken up. And then, um, yeah. And then my friend talked to him and we, we squashed the beef. Right. Any more yeah. run-ins since then? Um, actually, you know what? I, I ran into him once. I think, I think it was after that once more. And I was actually at Swingers in Hollywood, which is like a diner. And it's mm-hmm. like a hit hip kind of diner at least it was like 15 years ago or whatever and um i was sitting there and that dude came up skinhead robin put like a fork to my neck and said like come outside and fight me and then like believe it or not michael rapaport of all people stood up and like told him he'd have to like fight him and like (laughs) the dude like left (laughs) what the fuck (laughs) yeah yeah. big up but yeah that was the only time i ever got like punched i'm surprised it didn't happen more honestly but um, so that yeah. happened so he like, jumped you and then he again like tried to kick it off when you maybe that was before on. i'm not really sure the timeline but both of those things happened i'm just not sure in what order i just love the fact that like when he did actually hit you it was a plea for peace uh yeah, yeah <laughs> i thought that was funny too i was there to like see my friend in the alkaline trio and like i was like walked out from backstage and i thought like someone was gonna like tell me i was cool they were like do you do buddy <laughs> head like yeah and then he's like punched me i was like fuck Savage. yeah that was that was the the only time we got punched. so i mean i could be uh you know and i have to be deeply ashamed for this because i don't know enough about the transplants or good charlotte but a skinhead rob actually he was wasn't in good charlotte was he no no he's just the singer of the transplants they're just like boys i guess you know right oh, man i don't know whether that makes it better or worse <laughs> yeah it's bizarre right but well, i mean so you really didn't catch hands any more than that considering all of the the shit that's really it wow i feel like you've done pretty well man <laughs> yeah we came out pretty unscathed considering and i feel like didn't you have wes borland on your podcast like a few years back so yeah, yeah, Does I see mean... him once in a while. He, he's that he's mean... around. I see him once in a while. The the limp biscuit buddy head beef is squashed. Dude, I'm I'm just I'm I'm hoping Fred wants to produce my movie. Um well he's into that shit, right? Like that could actually be legit. He, does, he produces movies, yeah. That could be I the feel... that could be the best uh, beef squash of 2024, you know? It would be historic, I think, like for alternative rock bands i think it would (laughs) be iconic (laughs) i feel like that would add such another like meta layer to the whole film as well like if he ended up having some sort of hand in it as well it would be uh pretty funny yeah this is my olive branch (laughs) we're putting it out there fred durst he's gonna be the producer let's go dude executive producer it will probably be the best thing that he's ever had his uh, association to from a film point of view, I think. I agree with that. I don't want to judge. I haven't watched that movie with... Um, didn't he do a movie with John Travolta where he played yeah, a stalker? Seen- <laughs> um, I didn't need to. It looked bad. Didn't you... Um, so I was like going through the catalogue of supposed beefs and one that surprised me was, was there something with 
Axel Rose. Mm hmm. Yeah, we uh, like around the time, uh, what's it called? Chinese Democracy came out. Cause you know, it took like 14 years for them to put it out. And like right yeah. before it came out, like it, it leaked and we, we got like a copy of it. And my friend, who's like a rapper, he was like on grand Royal, which is like the beastie boys label. Mm -hmm. He actually got it first and he sent it to me, but he, he took one of the songs and like, didn't change it at all. And he just rapped over it. And he like, he like rapped about like, like slash should have kicked axel's ass for like saying the n-word and like how like axel was on cocaine and like and then at the end he was like if you're gonna sue anybody sue travis and we <laughs> like put it, and we like put this video up we like did like a slideshow because you know this is like 15 years ago but it was like right when yeah. iMovie came out so it was like cutting edge but we did like a slideshow of all these axel photos to it and then we put it up on i think youtube or somewhere and uh yeah we got a letter from axel's lawyer from that he actually did sue us was that was that a bummer because you're, you're like a pretty big gnr fan aren't you no i mean i thought it was great because he like <laughs> we watched it you know it yeah was, yeah this was, awesome. was killer and it's it, we, we only ever got cease and desist so we we never had to like go to court or anything okay so didn't have to like, like stand trial with axel when his all of the corn road glory that would have been great. <laughs> no, it's always like take it down in two weeks or right. or we'll really sue you, you know. Fair. I was um I was gonna ask you because obviously you you know, Buddy Head and just Icarus Lion, everything all steeped in kind of like, you know, punk. But whenever I've heard you actually talk about Guns N' Roses, you talk with like such reverence for them as a band when whenever I kind of like broach the conversation with like my mates who are like more aligned to punk they always just like completely will steer clear of them like wh what do you think what is your kind of like thing about gnr I mean, for me they were like i was like 10 years old when it came out so they were like the first band that was like you know like my own band i guess mm -hmm. like i mean I, I liked led zeppelin before but they were like not still a band you know it was like they were yeah. like some historic mystical thing you know and guns and roses were like i was they were just like the first band i ever liked as a kid and like you know kind of got turned on to like the misfits through them because they would cover them and duff was like the punk one and mm -hmm. what else like i think i heard the dam the first time because they covered them and uh heard of the stooges because they covered them yeah so like for me they were like kind of intertwined with punk you know even though they were like a rock and roll band they had like punk influences yeah, I mean, I think even at that time, it's I guess it's hard to look back at it now because if you talk about Guns N' Roses, people just think. I mean, yeah, like, they, they they started out in violins and it got pretty wild, but <laughs> and riding know. dolphins or whatever that shit was. But like Appetite, like uh, there's a there's an element of it that is that is punk, you know, under all the bass flange and shit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I've got a bit of love for that Duff bass sound. I'm not gonna lie, but I know <laughs> I know what you mean. Rules. Um. Aren't you yeah, like, I'm just like I'm just old enough and was just young enough when it came out that like I they're like you know they're like the band to me and it's also like kind of a joke like they got uh to be so goofy that it was just like almost hilarious to even like be a fan you know yeah I mean I st appetite is still an awesome kind of like kind of like Kanye like once you get like that famous it just becomes like a fucking joke too you know yeah I mean that's what i've kind of i've always thought they're actually such similar artists or at least axel and yeah. like if you think totally. of guns back in their heyday and all that chaos like and then look at what kanye does like kind of similar yeah axel doesn't like hitler though no that is a, a pretty big distinction <laughs> guy jumped off yeah what did you um did you ever bother seeing them when they reformed finally uh yeah yeah i actually saw them um let's see i saw them in 2016 i think like in august me and joe went we saw them at dodger stadium <laughs> oh, okay cool yeah i was gonna was, wonder uh, if you saw like, the troubadour or anything but you saw you got the full stadium experience yeah yeah i almost got arrested too like at the gate like i like we tried to walk in with weed and like the security like i had to like go leave and scalp a ticket because they were like trying to get the cops to like oh, no. fuck with me so like on the way in i almost got like fucked with had to go like buy another ticket and go on another exit 
but yeah we saw them uh it was kind of goofy they looked hilarious um, <laughs> but like they still sounded good at that point i heard they don't really sound good anymore but they, they still I sounded think, good. i think axel just like they're obviously like just pouring pouring the bollocks off it at the moment and i don't think his voice can take it i i think i saw him around a similar time and i thought he sounded great although he was wearing that whole uncle sam like yeah, he would up. come out in like t-shirts, like he'd do a wardrobe change and it would say like <laughs> which is back. And it would just be like so funny. Be, like, Wait, and they've out. got all of those like PS1 graphics of like a crazy yeah, yeah, train, yeah. like running like a, like a screensaver or something. <laughs> Wild. Um yeah. aren't talking of uh <laughs> just like bands and a fandom for a minute, aren't you weirdly and I say weirdly just because my impression has always been that Americans don't appreciate this band, but aren't you weirdly like a bit of an Oasis nut as well? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think more so like back in the day, like I don't really like ever listen to them, but right. yeah, I definitely liked Oasis a lot and met them a few times and th- they're pretty charming. Um, I think I was met? kind of more into their, like their attitude and just like their whole, whole lore. Um, mm-hmm. I-, I just like their vibe really. Um, I like that they're like, weirdly positive we're at the same time kind of dickheads yeah you know yeah we're forever but fuck you you know (laughs) (laughs) like the gym every song what was Uh, the um what were those nights where you had run-ins with them like i imagine pretty wild um let's see well one time let's see one time i was with nine inch nails and we like got into a van it was like raining at a festival like they played and it was raining and we got into a van and then they were either already in there or the next band they picked up was Oasis. I forget which way it went, but we were like, oh, wow, it's Oasis. And then we didn't really say anything for the rest of the ride. We just kind of drove through the rain. And then like a year later, like Noel played all these acoustic shows. It was when he was still in Oasis, but it was mm-hmm. like he was doing some like acoustic shows for something for like the greatest hits or something. Maybe I forget. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And he came up to me and recognized me. We were at the Troubadour and he he was like, you're in Nine Snails. And I was like, no, no, but I was on Troubadour. <laughs> That's crazy that you remember that. Because I remember because you're in fucking Oasis. But I was just like some dude. Yeah. And he, he was always like really cool. Um, I don't know. Uh, and then Liam's like pretty funny too. You know, the, the two of them together was was pretty funny. Yeah, you uh, make, what do you make of their uh, new stuff collectively? If you check uh, it out, I checked out the John Squire song that Liam did, and I thought it was kind of boring. Um, but you know, what do you what do you expect? I haven't really checked out any of the Noel stuff in a while. But the last one I didn't, the last one that I did here, I didn't really dig. Was it's that kind of like by, a contemporary? Was that by any chance the Who Built the Moon one, where he was kind of doing all like electronic stuff and I think horns I heard the and... one after that too? I think right. I heard that after that. Yeah. I feel like he just needs to get back to doing normal stuff. I, I feel like it's a phase that people go through and it's like hit their fifties or whatever. And it's like, Oh, I want to do a dance rock. Thing. It seems it's like, like, like no. time, just let him have a good time. You know, <laughs> true, true that <laughs> having fun. <laughs> I am um, just as a, um, just to kind of round out like the band side of things, but I thought it was interesting. Cause I, I basically got into you guys because I was a big uh, Queens of the Stone Age fan and a big Nine Inch Nails fan. And then like those, I feel like the guys in Queens would often feature in Buddyhead. And then obviously you were off on tour with uh, with Nine Inch Nails. Like, do you just have any, like the Nine Inch Nails tour must have been so weird. Do you have any tour, run-ins with either of those bands? You remember? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, they, we toured with both of them. Queens, uh, they did like a co-headlining tour for one of the tours for sure um i don't know nine inch nails was it was interesting because it was a uh, you know it was such a a bigger scale than i'd kind of been used to before the mm-hmm. only kind of comparable experience we had was opening for perfect circle which wasn't quite that big it was still like arena rock that was kind of yeah. like our sticker sign opening for perfect circle was kind of like our first taste of that but nine inch nails was such a bigger production you know um it was kind of like being on tour with a play more right. than like a rock band you know because once you've seen the show you've kind of seen it like everything is like on a click and it's like you know oh, on this song the screen comes out of the stage and then on this song the screen comes down in front of them and then like smoke comes out you know it's like 
it's just a different thing. It was also really cool just to see, you know, that dude be involved in everything from like the projections to like, you know, it's a whole other thing, you know, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a whole show, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was kind of cool being around it and like just the way we traveled it was great like it was like five star hotels and tour buses you know where you know the world we came from was like sleeping on floors and shitty vans with like not real seats you know like seats ripped <laughs> out or whatever, you know but um yeah i mean it was great we got to, i got to go to a lot of places i'd never been and um you know they played a lot of different cities and uh different festivals and i got to see a lot of other bands just from you know, the festivals that they played and stuff like that. It was, it was a really cool experience. Was it weird? Cause I always got the impression from you that, um, you just, you didn't not like them, but Nine Inch Nails weren't really your thing. So is it weird? I imagine having some like complete Nine Inch Nails freaks, like assume that you were. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, the band. yeah I, I was never a fan before. I mean, I had respect for them. Like, I think I bought the fragile when it came out. But I was uh-huh. like, you know, back in the 90s, it wasn't really my thing. Um, I kind of associated them with Marilyn Manson a little bit. You know, obviously yeah. he did that record. But um, yeah, I mean, I kind of became more of a fan just like watching how he, he worked and did things after the fact. But for sure, when my friend told me he was in Nine Inch Nails, it, like, I couldn't believe it. Like, it was like the last thing I thought he was going to say. It seemed so bizarre, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but, um, yeah and, their, and their fans were just like, you know super super fanatical you know I'd, ne- I'd never met people like that like there was certain people that went to like every show you know no matter where they played like even if they played like russia they were there or like mm-hmm. you know Europe, they played like a festival they'd still be there they'd be in front center like so they'd have to wait the whole day yeah. through the other bands. like there was people that were at every show and like would follow them like the grateful dead you know can't underestimate that's, that's Angst, my one man that's my one regret i should have made a documentary about those people <laughs> <laughs> totally that's what i mean like we've got a, a, a like a nine inch nails like band where it's like teenage angst and i mean he wasn't teenage but he's uh, perpetually been in angst and i feel like it just you know taps into people in a, in that weird fanatic zone where they just become completely enwrapped in everything that that guy's doing yeah yeah it's wild Side side note, you uh, you obviously mentioned touring with the Icarus Line on like far different scales, like on bands and stuff. I've like yeah, yeah. done a very very small amount of touring on a minor scale with like a couple of bands that I played in, and everyone, no matter what scale, whether you just do your weekend warriors or you're like out on the thing, has got a band story. So I was just wondering if you've got a, a classic band van story. Um, man, band van story. Uh, and, and never work for one i mean we had we had so many vans break down um nothing really comes to mind um i mean one tour we broke down like like 10 minutes outside of la i just remember we were like leaving for a tour and we got like 40 minutes into it and it was just like we died in some small town had to like start back over the next day and then at one point we had a van with just like no seats in it and i remember that the dudes in the band kept like a tour diary on the side of the the door with marker so it was like at the end of the tour it was just like this like look like cave drawings you know down the whole (laughs) whole thing but yeah no uh we had tons of van tours but yeah sorry i'm not coming through on this one (laughs) Uh, it's no worries man maybe you just one of the few (laughs) without uh a dreadful one like our door fell off like down the motorway that kind of shit was just Classic. Yeah, we luckily never had any accidents or anything, nothing like that. Just a lot of vans that didn't really work that well. That I mean, that is universal. That element of it. Yeah. Um, we um, it's coming up in a couple of weeks, obviously, to kind of anniversary, sadly, of uh, of Lanigan passing away. And I know you kind of got to work with him quite a lot, sort of towards the end. There was that. I mean, it seemed from the outside that quite a short amount of time but you guys seem to really hit it off what was the kind of what kind of sparked that if you don't mind me asking uh i think and i could be mistaken here but i think the way i mean we met him back in the day through uh like i met him a couple times through his manager and then when ickerstein opened for queens of stone age like we met him then 
Mm-hmm. But I think when we reconnected with him was when Joe worked on the Lawless soundtrack, which is like the Nick Cave movie. And yeah. he was that's great as well, by the way. Yeah, he I just got it on vinyl yesterday, actually, which is random. <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, super that's random. Nice. And um, yeah, uh, Joe was like a Sistine engineer on that, I think. And they needed a singer and Joe recommended Mark. And I'm not sure how he'd reconnected with him, but they they had. And then after that, we made like a, a video for him for Stitch It Up. And then I started shooting like all of his uh, uh, press photos for the next couple records. And then Joe obviously made the Dark Mark and Skeleton Joe rec- record with him. And uh, I think he's got a second one that's about to be finished too of stuff that he did before he died that he's oh, been no way. Kind of trying to round out. Um, but yeah, I, I, was, I, was, I was always like kind of surprised that he liked us so much. I always felt like, you know, he was just so cool. Um, kind of like a cool older brother, you know? Right. I always he's... felt really lucky to kind of get to know him even, even through the, the short period of time that, that we did. He seemed like, um, I I randomly bumped into him once and I remember at the time I was like didn't even know whether to say hi and I don't normally um because obviously of his kind of like whole vibe and you hear stories or whatever but it seemed it like he did yeah he was he was super nice he was re- like chatted to me way longer than he needed to um super friendly I was like kind of walked away with my head spinning a little bit because I thought I was just going to get like a, maybe at best like a gruff hey at worst like a fuck off <laughs> I mean he is kind of like that but he's also like the sweetest dude ever like he's mm. intimidating and huge and kind of scary but he's also like the sweetest dude ever he's like kind of a dichotomy was there um was there a difference from where you kind of met him in passing like back in the early 2000s to when you kind of reconnected later on Oh, for sure. Like the first time I met him, like his manager, like introduced us. He was like, this is the guy that does buddy head. And he like, was like, can you go give me a coffee? And the manager was like, you don't have to do that. Don't, don't do that. And I, I mean, think he I would have just like, I think he definitely straight away. Probably softened a little bit as he got older for sure. <laughs> for sure. Amazing. Yeah. So, um, what's on the, what's on the horizon for American Primo? Uh, well, we're moving into an office space and those dudes are working on a scripted movie that Joe wrote and they got their first wave of funding. So they have like a casting director and they're um, offering actors. And that's the way I'm learning about the film industry. That's the way it happens. Like you get like an initial wave and then you attach some names to it and then you sell that. Right. And you get your money to make the movie. So they're at the first stage with that right now. And that's exciting. Then- we're trying to find a producer for the buddy head movie and find funding. So we've just been going around and taking meetings and talking to people that have already made movies and asking them how to do it, how to do it for real. So Mm -hmm. those things. And then I've just been DJing a lot and um, we'll probably be doing a a book as well. That'll be like a companion piece to the buddy head thing. It'll be like a lot of the photos with some, you know, explanations and shit like that. little, if you like the movie, it'll be like a little bit d- deeper dig, you know? Nice. Oh, so much stuff to look forward to. I mean, it's definitely in someone's interest to finance that buddy of movie because it would just be such, such a great story. <laughs> Thanks, man. What's the, um, so kind of like just last thing I wanted to ask you, I uh, perpetually had that feeling when I was younger of when I'd go to, to buddy head, both kind of like originally. And then when you like revived, it in the kind of mid teens where I'd be yeah. like, okay, I want to see what they think about like this album. I'm sure this is going to be cool. And then it would get completely, completely roasted. I feel like, especially in the mid teens, you were kind of completely off like rock stuff. I'm just wondering like what's, what's floating your boat at the moment. Uh, I listen to a lot of Cumbia lately, like a lot of like West coast Cumbia. Okay. Probably my favorite artist is this this dude Amante Del for Toro, um, nice. and also uh, Turbo Three Thousand. And uh, what else have I listened to? I'm trying to think. Uh, I like this uh, Detroit house artist called High Tech. They do like they call it ghetto house. It's kind of like really fast rap music with like a oh, lot sick. of samples. 
And let's see, what else have I been listening to? Hang on, let me look. Uh, I like the new 21 Savage record. Um, yeah, some I've older been listening to that as well. I like, uh, there's this Holly Go Lightly record I've been really obsessed with. It's called God Don't Like It. And, nice. Uh, yeah, what sort of vibe is that? It's like, uh, I don't know, like garage rock meets like R&B. Sounds super timeless. Could be like made in 1950 or last year. You're not really sure. Uh, what else have I been listening to? A lot of wipers. A lot of the weird wiper records. Um, this one, Follow Blind. It's like not one of the popular ones. Nice. I've always, they're a band that I've always like been meaning to listen to and then just haven't. I feel like I need to dive in. You got to start with the first three records. That's Those are okay. the ones. The first one's just nonstop hits. The first one's like the punk one. It's 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 great. All to all bangers. Uh, and then I've been listening to this dude, Micaiah McRaven, quite a bit. Um, um I've got like, I've got like three records about him. That dude, he's, he's so good. Yeah, I like him a lot. I feel like he churns out like two or three records like a year as well. Year. Yeah, or at least like every year, at least one a year. And then what else? I've been listening to. I was trying to think of like one more new thing. Oh yeah, I've been listening to this dude too. Oh, I can't show you, but King Steady Beat. He's like a local. He actually runs a record store in San Pedro um, oh, called cool. Steady Records, and he has a record label called Steady Beat. And uh, yeah, but he does like kind of like uh, West Coast cumbia. He's he's really good. He's like a, kind of a local legend. He's from the ska scene. Nice. Um, yeah, I guess that's about it. And then like a ton of like old stuff that I DJ, like um, a lot of new wave and shit, a lot of noise, a lot of kraut rock. Um, awesome. like kraut I was rock. wondering what the vibe of your DJ sets are like, because I've never been able to tune into a, to one of your streams. But yeah, I was wondering about that. Yeah, it's kind of all over the place. Um, soul music, funk, James Brown, Funkadelic. Nice. But also like noise and then like punk rock um new wave and then usually when i get drunk latin music <laughs> sick i have to check into <laughs> it is there anything from the old day that you proper ragged on that you've like since softened on a little bit i mean if i hear the first strokes record and i've had like a couple beers it sounds all right right yeah because they were like again kind of off. i mean i still think fodder. i still think they're like goofy though but you yeah. <laughs> know but yeah, I mean, I can, I mean, I can kind of like stomach anything. Everything is kind of cool these days, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you know, it's like nothing's really like that bad. I, I find it funny, like constantly and I'll just, I'll, I'll admit it, but like, you know. I... Everything's so bad that like music doesn't really seem that bad to me anymore. <laughs> <That makes, laughs> Everything's I'm kind of fine with all of it, honestly. All right there we go thanks again to travis for being a legend and a great guy to chat with if you've made it this far and you're not already subscribed please do so not only will there be more interviews with important figures in the underground but monday to friday we're slinging album reviews that i'm sure you'll love hit it up and i'll see you in the next video cheers mate bye <laughs>